So just like we motivated the inverse sine function by looking at the sine function first, switching the x's and y's, and then plotting it on our Cartesian plane, we're going to do the same thing with the cosine graph. And um, I have it already here set for you. And you'll notice that the same problem arises. If we try to find the inverse of cosine, the issue we have, if you, if you look at the bottom graph here, is that it uh, it fails the the vertical line test, so it's not a function. All right, so um, let's fix that the same way we fixed that issue when we were finding the appropriate graph for the inverse sine graph. So here we have our cosine graph. And again, the issue now is that its inverse will fail the vertical line test so long as this fails the horizontal line test. So we can see that this fails the horizontal line test. So we need to fix that. So there are many things you could do to fix this. The math community has decided to eliminate all x values up into up until 0 and all x values after pi and so that means that our restricted domain that we're going to generate the inverse from is 0, so we want 0, to pi, and we want to include pi. All right. So there you go. Now it, pa now it passes the horizontal line test, and it's, uh, its inverse, therefore, will pass the vertical line test. So here's what the graph of uh, inverse cosine will look like. So this is going to be y equals inverse cosine. So I'm just going to plot uh, the, I'm going to flip the x and y coordinates. So 0, comma 1 becomes 1, comma 0. Uh, pi over 2, 0 comes 0, pi over 2. And pi, comma, negative 1, pi, comma, negative 1 becomes negative 1, comma, pi. All right. And the shape that this uh, function takes on is like that. Okay, so for instance, we'd say that uh, we'd say that cosine inverse cosine inverse of zero is equal to pi over two. In other words, the ratio when I when I uh, when I input the ratio zero, the angle that gave me that ratio was pi over two, right? Uh, and there's another example: inverse cosine of one is equal to zero. In other words, the angle that gives me the ratio of one turned out to be zero. Now, one thing you should notice is that we can just looking at this picture. It's easy to come up with the domain and range of cosine inverse. Right, the domain of cosine inverse is negative one to one, and the range is zero to pi. So the range of the inverse turned out to be that our restricted domain up here of our original cosine function. All right. So notice it's, it's we're flipping things now. Now the domain is, is all the ratios you can get, right? We're inputting ratios, and we're the output is the angle that got you there. Uh, what does that mean in terms of the unit circle? It means that the quadrants that we're going to cross off are the angles that we need to consider. I mean, the the range is zero to pi, so we're not going to consider any angles that take us essentially into these. Uh, into these negative quadrants, right? Because 
0, an angle of 0 is here, and an angle of pi is here. So those are really the angles in between 0 and pi, including 0 and pi. That, th that's the only place where we can cons consider answers for um, for the inverse cosine function, okay? So you'll you'll not want to consider these these the angles in the quadrants down uh, down below the x-axis. So let's have a look now at the inverse tangent function. I'll go a little more quickly. So we come up across the same problem with tangent. If we want to get an inverse for it, we've got to restrict the domain. So we'll restrict the domain to make it past the To make it past the vertical, the horizontal line test, rather. And again, there's many options, but we're going to use what the math community used, which was to get rid of everything to the left of pi over 2 and everything to the right of pi over 2. I'm sorry, everything to the left of negative pi over 2 and everything to the right of positive pi over 2. And so now what we will do is sketch the inverse. So again our restricted domain is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Soft brackets, right? Because those are asymptotes. And so now those, uh, if we switch the x and y values, then those two asymptotes which were vertical are now horizontal. Right? And so if we sort of flip the x and y coordinates here, 0, 0 stays at 0, 0. Um, and if you use a little bit of reasoning here, you'll remember that the tangent of pi over 4 is 1. So we would be graphing uh, pi over 4 uh, I'm sorry, we'd be graphing 1 comma pi over 4, which would be about here. And similarly, the tangent of negative pi over 4 is negative 1, so we'll be plotting negative 1, negative pi over 4, which is roughly here. And in any case, the shape looks like this. So it's like a sideways tangent graph. Alright, so um, we can talk about the domain of this of this inverse here. This is tan inverse, tan inverse, and its domain is negative infinity to infinity. You can see, and its range uh, is negative pi over two to pi over two. All right, and so we can say a few things about this. For instance, uh, tan inverse of 1. When I input 1 as a ratio, what is the angle that gave me that? Well, clearly, we can see that it's pi over 4. Okay, just as an example. And so what does that mean in terms of our unit circle? It means that when we're discussing or we're evaluating inverse trig functions we want to consider only angles that are in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 so that eliminates that eliminates the bottom two quadrants I'm sorry it eliminates the left two quadrants because negative pi over 2 is here and pi over 2 is here so we consider only angles that range from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, not including them. All right, so there's the motivation for the inverse trig functions, or the cosine and inverse tangent in this video. Uh, and in the later videos, we'll talk about how we actually use them.